Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Eisner. I'm uh, at UC Santa Cruz Chemistry Department. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to tell you about, about this work. Uh, what I'll be telling you about today is our work on water-soluble conjugated polymers as primary components in a water-based light harvesting system. So before I do that, uh, I want to very quickly acknowledge the people that made this work possible. Um, first and foremost is my current PhD student, Anna Johnston, who did uh, the over overwhelming fraction of the work that I'll be talking about today, as well as some past and present students, uh, uh, Will Hollingsworth and uh, Levi Matsushima. And of course, the uh, National Science Foundation for giving us the funding to do this work and uh, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source for access to the synchrotron facility to do small angle uh, X-ray scattering. So the overarching problem on which we're working uh, is as follows. We'd like to construct a soft, structurally tractable, and panchromatic light harvesting system, and we'd like to do this in water uh, in a modular kind of self-assembly kind of way. And the structural, uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of being structurally tractable is very important. So, you know, to give you an example of what I consider as structurally intractable is uh, just a small part uh, of a natural light harvesting photosynthetic system in a chloroplast, specifically the thylakoid membrane. And even in this very abstract kind of biology based, uh, you know, coarse grained view of what the thylakoid membrane uh, looks like from the perspective of photosynthesis, it already looks structurally intractable. It's just too complex. We don't have the ability to, you know, spatially uh, uh, configure such a system and position these uh, disparate components to execute such a complex uh, conversion of sunlight to, to chemical potential energy, and then eventually to, to the synthesis of new chemical bonds and, and molecules. And so in my group, we work with uh, uh, conjugated polyelectrolytes, which are water-soluble ionic conjugated polymers. And we believe that these systems can be the building blocks of a soft aqueous light harvesting system for a number of reasons. First and foremost, conjugated polymers have delocalized pi electrons. And this is desirable for, from the perspective of moving electronic charges and electronic excited states, or excitons as I'll refer to them, uh, through space uh, over distances that are large compared to the kind of molecular dimensions of a single monomer that makes up the polymer backbone. Uh, Furthermore, these delocalized pi electrons are strongly coupled to the ionic degrees of freedom. These ionic side chains that impart the aqueous solubility, but also the, the propensity to, to, uh, to self-assemble. And as the ionic degrees of freedom evolve, or as these side chains move, perhaps in response to the ionic atmosphere in which they find themselves, they tug and pull on the delocalized pi electrons. And as the delocalized pi electrons adjust to what the ionic degrees of freedom do, the effect things like the... the uh, uh, the mobility of charge carriers, the, the uh, transport of electronic excited states, and generally the electronic uh, uh, states of the system. And so this is actually quite desirable and very interesting from a number of uh, points of view. These conjugated polymers, these conjugated polyelectrolytes, or CPEs as I refer to them, have rich many bonding interactions. And just as, as, uh, as some of, uh, of the interactions that they possess uh, that I list here are water pi interactions or hydrogen bonding between water molecules and these delocalized pi electrons, ion pi interactions like cation pi and, and uh, uh, anion pi interactions, of course, pi pi interactions, hydrophobic interactions, and so on. And so the totality of these uh, interactions, uh, in our opinion, gives them much potential to serve as complex uh, hierarchical assemblies uh, for, for, for the uh, the, the purpose of converting sunlight to usable energy, like storing chemical potential energy. And so in our previous work, what we've done is we, we, we've looked at uh, pairs of oppositely charged poly, uh, CPEs where one of the CPEs uh, served as an exciton donor and the other CPE served as an exciton acceptor. And what we showed is that if you put these systems together under the right conditions in water, in dilute solution, they self-assemble and they give rise to ultra-fast exciton transfer from the donor, in this case, this uh, uh, polyfluorine alphenylene uh, model CPE with cationic side chains. Uh, once it's excited, we've shown in collaboration with the R. Bragg group at John, Johns Hopkins University that these excited states very rapidly transfer to the exciton acceptor, in this case, a polythiophene based polymer, um, in a time of order 250 femtoseconds. This kind of energy transfer time scale is commensurate with what you find in natural light harvesting systems, which was quite exciting for us. But What's perhaps most special about these kinds of systems, uh, particularly as compared to charged small molecules, 
is that the connectivity, the physical connectivity between the monomers that make up the polymer backbone leads to really complex and very exciting and very interesting phase behavior uh, that is at the forefront of research in the non-conjugated polyelectrolyte community. And so for example, if one takes two oppositely charged polyelectrolytes, non-conjugated polyelectrolytes, puts them together at ionic charge equivalents, at, at, at ionic stoichiometry, um, and looks at what happens uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the solution as a function of increasing ionic strength in the presence of simple ions, what you find is that these polyelectrolytes, they separate and they form a dilute solution and coexisting with a concentrated solution or what some people refer to as a dense phase. And this nice example from the group of uh, Joe Schlenoff uh, in Florida showed, shows that as you take these two uh, common synthetic polyelectrolytes and you dial in the concentration of potassium bromide, KBR, what you find is that this phase separation qualitatively changes from something that one can describe as a precipitate-like solid to ultimately a liquid. And so you get liquid-liquid phase separation. And the amount of these relative phases is tuned by the, amount, by the concentration of the small ion, in this case, KBR, eventually at high enough ionic strength, merging into a single fully dissolved solution from what started was a uh, what, what, from what, what began as a phase separated solution. And if one looks at these solutions under the microscope, what you find if you agitate the full system and to be, uh, you know, to be uh, macroscopically homogeneous is that there is these, uh, you know, uh, effectively drops of liquid swimming through uh, the, the, the dilute solution, showing you that it's a true liquid-liquid phase separation phenomenon. And this interest in the phase separation of, of, of the liquid-liquid phase separation has gained interest, uh, you know, in communities as diverse as biology, where people believe that uh, charged polypeptides uh, may have perhaps been the precursors, precursors to the first organelles, so-called membraneless organelles, the kind of organelle that you find in the middle of the nucleus of a cell specifically the nucleolus. And uh, gr groups like the Christine Keening group uh, have shown that if you take these polypeptides that are charged, they form these what are called coacervate droplets, so these dense phases that are highly enriched in these polyelectrolytes upon phase separation. And once again, if you fluorescently tag them, you can show that these form these, uh, th these liquid drops. So our interest began in, in, you know, in the phase behavior of these systems for these kind of observations. And so we looked at the phase behavior of, of a of what has now become a model conjugated polyelectrolyte for us, this polyfluorine uh, uh, alt-phenylene polymer. We put it together with a, with a common polystyrene sulfonate polymer. And what we found is that at high enough ionic strength, in this example, lithium bromide, they did not form liquids. They formed what, what we have now come to know as a colloidal gel. And in fact, the, the, the picture that we formed was uh, you know, a system, again, coexisting in dilute solution of these polyelectrolytes. But in the colloidal gel, you have these regions that are, you know, strongly aggregated regions of very short fluorescence lifetimes and extended regions with relatively long fluorescence lifetimes. But of course, what we ultimately wanted to get to is a light harvesting complex fluid where both polyelectrolytes had to be conjugated and had to act as an exciton donor acceptor pair. And if we were able to do this, what we would gain is you know, intrinsic proximity between the donor acceptor pairs in this very dense, highly concentrated, but fluid phase uh, where energy transfer ideally would be very efficient, but would also allow for molecular diffusion throughout. So you can catalyze perhaps some photochemical processes. And the question is, can small ions stabilize such a fluid state? And so that's what we came, you know, kind of went after. And we hypothesized that compared to something like a, an inorganic simple K plus cation, organic cations would help stabilize such a fully conjugated, very hydrophobic complex morphology in water, uh, keeping it fluid, and, and would perhaps lead to more efficient exciton transfer. And we, the way we looked at this was to, to look at this PFPI, this, this common polymer that I've shown you already, and coupled it with an exciton acceptor that is similar from the perspective of a, a, of a linear charge density. They have very similar charge densities and side chain orientation with respect to the backbone. So the registry between side chains would be relatively similar. And we looked at this, you know, ionic uh, uh, or the, the, the small ion molecular series where the ions were of a comparable size, but ranged, you know, different in their geometry and, and, uh, and you know, whether they had conjugation or not. And so that's the system that we looked at. And uh, what we found very quickly by looking at the fluorescence microscope images is that the organic ions stood apart. And so what I'm showing you here is the results for this uh, EMIB ion shown over here, but all the results for organic ions were qualitatively similar and also quant qualitatively different from KBR. What I'm showing you here is that the system starts off as a colloidal gel, 
And as you increase the concentration of the organic ion, ultimately what you find is that the solution uh, starts to merge into a single uh, dissolved state, like what, what uh, Joe Schlenoff had shown and other people's non-conjugated polyoxalates. This does not happen with KBR. And in fact, you can see this from the turbidity plot where we plot the percent transmittance as a function of uh, salt concentration. You can see that for all the organic ions or everybody, not KBR, the turbidity go, uh, goes down or the percent transmittance goes up at the high salt concentration, but not the case for the KBR. So these organic ions really truly stand apart as far as the, the phase behavior is concerned. What we also found is that if you look at this fully dissolved state and you do small angle X-ray scattering on it, you see these kind of, you know, kind of two Gunier-like plateaus in the Sachs curve showing you that there's, you know, strong evidence for hierarchical structure of uh, roughly on the 10 nanometer and the one nanometer length scale, which is quite interesting. They do not dissolve as isolated chains. They seem to dissolve as complexes at high salt. So what about the concentrated phase? You can centrifuge a solution, isolate the concentrated phase. And what I want to show you here is that the concentrated phase is truly a complex fluid. It has this you know, kind of a toothpaste-like appearance. You can see this cute little shark fin of a phase that we isolated, uh, you know, that is highly viscous, more viscous uh, than the half-conjugated case that I briefly showed you earlier, which is quite interesting. What about the optical properties? First and foremost, we find that uh, by looking at the fluorescent spectrum of, of the concentrated phase, you can see that, that there is a region that corresponds to donor fluorescence, there is a region that corresponds to acceptor fluorescence. And compared to the control hydrogel sample of the donor only, the fluorescence of the donor is completely quenched in the, in the concentrated phase. Um, this tells us that exciton transfer is effectively 100% efficient. Uh, all the excitons generated on the donor within their excited, excited state lifetime transfer to the exciton acceptor, this, uh, the, the, the one I showed previously. What we also find is that there's some interesting, relatively subtle changes in the vibronic ratio of the fluorescent spectrum of the, of the exciton acceptor, showing that there are some non-trivial changes that go on with the, with the backbone of the acceptor polymer, uh, uh, um, you know, even when one looks beyond the, the, the exciton transfer that I just described. And this vibronic ratio does depend on the ion that you look at, particularly once again, you know, making, making KBR stand apart from this EMIB. You can see how this vibronic ratio is quite different from that of, uh, that of KBR. Now, one can go one step further and, and interrogate the exciton acceptor itself, um, you know, kind of following exciton transfer and summarizing lots of work in this one figure, we were able to extract the average fluorescence lifetime of the acceptor polymer in this concentrated complex fluid state. And what you find is that the fluorescence lifetime doesn't really change much over a significant concentration range of the ions, but at, once you cross the kind of 1.5 molar threshold, uh, for KBR, it changes very little. Uh, for EPB, this pyrrol pyr pyrrolidinium ion, it actually goes down for reasons that I don't, don't have time to get into. But for the other organic ions, it goes up. And particularly for this T, for this uh, tetraethyl ammonium ion, you know, it goes up by 100% roughly. It goes up by almost a factor of two. So it's a significant change telling us that the fluorescence lifetime or the, 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 the microstructure of the uh, acceptor chain at high ionic strength is actually quite different. And uh, sweeping a lot of details under the rug, it tells us that the exciton is actually quite delocalized over the, over the acceptor chain in the high ionic strength limit. This is interesting and important from the perspective of once you do the initial exciton transfer from the donor to the acceptor, that exciton on the acceptor then has to diffuse along that polymer network and eventually ultimately find a hetero interface where the exciton will become electron hole pairs, which is the precursor for any kind of interesting photochemistry that the, such a system might do. And so to summarize what we found, uh, we've shown that it associated phase separation of these CPEs leads to liquid-like properties, but not a coacervate, uh, like what's found in, in non-conjugated systems, uh, at least with these chemical structures. And we'll have a lot more to say about this with some new conjugated polymers that we recently synthesized. Uh, these concentrated phases are highly viscous and they're truly complex fluids with very efficient exciton transfer, uh, again, all water-based. Uh, and that these organic ions can stabilize the fully dissolved state at high ionic strength, but they do not seem to hold any advantage as far as exciton transfer is concerned, regardless of what ion you use, exciton transfer is highly efficient. And so all of these kind of findings uh, uh, make us really excited about the future of these kinds of systems, whether as, you know, as, as standalone uh, systems uh, that with, with modularity or also as parts of a more complex overarching system that perhaps has a membrane shell that encloses it, 
uh, you know, a, akin to the what one sees in, uh, in natural photosynthetic systems. And with that, I'd like to thank the organizers again, and thank you very much for, uh, for your attention.